This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 6 The Defense of Washington Growth of an Army Foresight of the Magnitude of the War Memorandum to the President Letter to Secretary Cameron Reference to any good map will show that Washington is situated on the point of confluence of the main Potomac with the Anacostia, or eastern branch thereof. The ground occupied by the city is low, though by no means flat, and is commanded from all directions by heights within easy range of even modern field artillery. Moral and political considerations alike rendered it necessary to retain the seat of government in Washington, although its situation was the most unfavorable that could be conceived under the circumstances of the case. So far as military operations were concerned, it would have been well could the capital have been removed to New York, but this was impossible. The defense of the capital, containing, as it did, the executive and legislative, the archives of the government, the public buildings, the honor and prestige of the nation, and, as time moved on, vast amounts of military supplies, was a matter of vital importance, and it was necessary to protect it not only from capture, but also against insult. To accomplish this without fortifications would have required an army of great strength, so large as to detract fatally from the efficiency of the active armies. It was therefore absolutely necessary to resort to fortifications, and circumstances required that they should be of a temporary nature. As I have already stated, I found the capital entirely defenseless, and at once determined upon the system to be pursued. During the months of August and September, the work of organization and fortification proceeded as rapidly as circumstances permitted. Naturally, there were frequent reports as to the movements of the enemy in advance, sometimes of intended crossings below Alexandria, sometimes above the city. In the early part of August, when we were so entirely open to attack, these reports gave me no little uneasiness. And even after we had reached a point of comparative security, so far as the safety of Washington was concerned, the probable effects of an inroad in any form into Maryland rendered it necessary to be constantly on the alert and take every precaution to prevent a crossing of the river. As soon as General Banks came under my command, August 20th, 1861, I directed him to cross to the eastern bank of the Monocacy, leaving one regiment to observe the Potomac above Harper's Ferry, and another to watch it from the latter place to the mouth of the Monocacy and to put his main body not far from Hyattstown, thus placing him in position to oppose any attempt at crossing the river above Harper's Ferry, while his junction with the force at Washington would be secure of the enemy's crossing below the Monocacy. In his former position, at Sandy Hook, he was too far from Washington. He was ordered to move his surplus and heavy stores from Frederick to Baltimore or Washington, and his surplus transportation to the latter place to oppose any passage of the Potomac by the enemy, provided it would not involve his separation from the main army, and to support Stone when necessary, and, if forced back by superior numbers, to retreat on Rockville. He was also instructed to protect the railroad, as well as practicable, without making too heavy detachments. Up to this period, and until about the beginning of September, there was reason to apprehend some attack of the enemy, at all events, reports to that effect frequently arrived, and we were not for some time in condition to offer successful resistance. It must never be forgotten that at this period the spirit of secession was active and bitter in many parts of Maryland. Baltimore had given too full proof of the feeling of a large part of its inhabitants in all classes. In the northern and western counties there were many secessionists, though the Union Party was also strong. But in the southern and southeastern counties the Union people were very few. In this condition of affairs, with our communications and lines to supply all passing through Maryland, it was too dangerous to even allow small portions of the enemy to cross the river, and it was therefore necessary to employ much larger numbers of troops on the frontier, on the line of communication, and in observation through the state than would have been the case if Pennsylvania, for example, had been the frontier state. Before the middle of August, General Smith's pickets were thrown across the river at the chain bridge, on the 3rd of September, while reviewing troops east of the capital, 
I received dispatches to the effect that the enemy had appeared in force opposite the chain bridge and towards Great Falls, also that they were probably on the point of advancing along their whole line. After giving the necessary orders at other points, I rode to General Smith's headquarters at the chain bridge, and determined to move his brigade across the river during the night and to entrench a position on the Virginia side as the surest method of saving the bridge. I ordered up King's brigade and a battery to support him, and directed the cavalry and reserve artillery and other troops in the city to be held in readiness to move up if necessary. McCall was also ordered to send an additional regiment and two more guns to Great Falls, and to hold the rest of his command in readiness to move either towards Great Falls or the Chain Bridge, as circumstances might require. Early during the night, Smith crossed and at once commenced the construction of Forts Maury and Ethan Allen, positions which I had already examined. On the 28th of September, Smith's division marched out to Falls Church, which movement, in connection with an advance of a part of Franklin's division on the Leesburg Pike, of McDowell's on Ball's Crossroads and Upton's Hill, and of Porter's on Hall's Hill, determined the evacuation of Munson's, Upton's, and Taylor's Hills by the enemy's outposts, who had now seen the last of Washington until Early's raid in 1864. Taylor's, Perkins, Upton's, and Munson's Hills were occupied by a brigade of McDowell's divisions, who at once commenced to work upon the necessary fortifications. The occupation of this point was of great importance, as it gave ample room in rear for moving the troops in any direction, and in the event of my deciding to attack Centerville, would enable me to reach that place in one march from the outposts. Immediately after the occupation of this new position, the camp of Porter's division was moved forward to Hall's and Munson's Hill, in easy supporting distance. A few days later, Smith's division was moved to Marshall's Hill. To support this movement, McCall's division was, on the 9th of October, brought to the Virginia side to Langley's, and a few days later to Prospect Hill. He was replaced at Tennelly Town by a brigade of Buell's division. On the 5th of October, Heinzelman's division was formed and posted at Fort Lyon, south of Alexandria, forming the left of our line on the Virginia side. During the months of September and October, Sickles' brigade, posted on the south side of the eastern branch, sent frequent reconnaissances into lower Maryland. Early in November, Hooker's division was organized and moved to the vicinity of Bud's Ferry to observe the enemy, who were active in that direction, and to prevent, as far as possible, the crossing of the river by emissaries of the enemy. So that early in November, the positions of the command were as follows. On the right, McCall's division at Prospect Hill, Smith's division at McCall's Hill, holding Lewinsville by an advanced guard, Porter's division at Miners and Hall's Hills, McDowell at Arlington, with one brigade at Munson's Hill, etc. Blanker's division at Hunter's Chapel. Franklin at the Theological Seminary. Heinzelman at Fort Lyon. There were thus on the Virginia side seven divisions, so posted as to cover every avenue of approach, and to afford assistance to every point that could be attacked, and moreover in position to advance on Centerville if necessary. On the north of Washington, Buell's division held Tennelly Town and the other important points, supported by Casey's provisional brigades, the reserve artillery and the cavalry depots, while Stone's division at Poolsville and Banks' division at Darnstown observed the upper river and were in position to retire upon Washington if attacked by superior forces. Hooker was in the vicinity of Bud's Ferry. By the 30th of September, several of the principal works were pretty well advanced, but a great deal still remained to be done to complete the system. I shall refer elsewhere to the inconveniences resulting from the position of Washington and the nature of the frontier formed by the Potomac. In this place it will suffice to say, as the Potomac is often fordable, and many of the inhabitants on the Maryland side were favorable to the enemy, it was a very necessary and difficult task to guard it properly. In view of its exposed position and immense political importance, it was impossible to allow Washington to be endangered, so that a garrison was always necessary, and all that could be done was to make the fortification so strong that a comparatively small garrison would suffice. After the experience of the first bull run, the executive would never consent to leave Washington without a large garrison. 
At this juncture, it would have been wise to adopt a definite policy with regard to the regular army, viz. either virtually break it up as a temporary measure and distribute its members among the staff and regiments of the volunteer organization, thus giving the volunteers all possible benefit from the discipline and instruction of the regulars, or to fill the regular regiments to their full capacity and employ them as a reserve at critical junctures. I could not secure the adoption of either plan, and a middle course was followed which resulted less favorably than either of the plans indicated. But it must be said that even as things were, the regulars were in every way of immense benefit to the service. As a general rule, the officers, and of course the non-commissioned officers, of the volunteer regiments were entirely ignorant of their duties, and many were unfitted from their education, moral character, or mental deficiencies for ever acquiring the requisite efficiency. These latter were weeded out by courts martial and boards of examination, while the others were instructed pari passu as they instructed their men. The small number of regular officers available rendered it impossible to furnish all the staff officers from among them, so that a regiment was very fortunate if its colonel was a regular officer, and a brigade was lucky to have a regular as its commander. The generals were usually, and colonels always, obliged to appoint their staff officers from civil life, and instruct them as best they could. It speaks wonders for the intelligence and military aptitude of our people that so much was done in this way on both sides. Many of these raw civilians, who were men of pride, intelligence, and education, soon became excellent officers, though these very men most keenly regretted their lack of a good military education in early life. The frequent reviews I held at Washington were not at all for the benefits of the public, nor yet for the purpose of examining the individual condition of the men, though I did much of that even on these occasions. For a general with a quick eye can see things when riding at a gallop which would seem impossible to a civilian. But they were to accustom the regiments to move together and to see each other, to give the troops an idea of their own strength, to infuse esprit de corps and mutual emulation, and to acquaint myself with the capacity of the general officers. These reviews also had a good effect in accustoming the troops to see me, although they saw so much of me in their camps and on the picket lines that this was of minor importance. With new troops, frequent reviews are of the greatest utility and produce the most excellent effect. Those I held did much towards making the Army of the Potomac what it became. Some persons, who ought to have known better, have supposed that in organizing the Army of the Potomac I set too high a model before me, and consumed unnecessary time in striving to form an army of regulars. This was an unjustifiable error on their part. I should, of course, have been glad to bring that army to the condition of regulars. But no one knew better than myself that, with the means at my command, that would have been impossible within any reasonable or permissible time. What I strove for and accomplished was to bring about such a condition of discipline and instruction that the army could be handled on the march and on the field of battle, and that orders could be reasonably well carried out. No one cognizant of the circumstances and possessed of any knowledge of military affairs can honestly believe that I bestowed unnecessary time and labor upon the organization and instruction of that army whose courage, discipline, and efficiency finally brought the war to a close. In spite of all the clamor to the contrary, the time spent in the camps of instruction in front of Washington was well bestowed, and produced the most important and valuable results. Not a day of it was wasted. The fortifications then erected, both directly and indirectly, saved the capital more than once in the course of the war, and enabled the army to maneuver freely and independently. The organization and discipline then acquired, and so much improved during the campaign of the peninsula, which converted the men into veterans, enabled the army to pass gloriously through the many sanguinary conflicts and harassing campaigns that proved necessary to terminate the war. They learned to gain victories and to withstand defeat. No other army we possessed could have met and defeated the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. And with all the courage, energy, and intelligence of the Army of the Potomac, it probably would not have been equal to that most difficult task without the advantage it enjoyed during its sojourn in the camps around Washington. Early in August, more or less trouble and discontent appeared among some of the regiments in relation to their term of service. In fact, many of those who enlisted during the first excitement had no expectation of engaging for a long war, and, when they found the three months' regiments returning home in large numbers, 
became much dissatisfied. In two cases this culminated in open mutiny on the part of large numbers of the officers and men. In the case of one regiment I brought them to order by directing the transportation of sixty-three of the number as prisoners to the dry Tortugas, to labor there during the remainder of the war. In the case of the other, the following order was issued. Special Order Number 27 Headquarters, Division of the Potomac, Washington, August 14, 1861 The General commanding this division learns with the utmost pain that decided insubordination, if not open mutiny, has been displayed by a large portion of the 79th Regiment of New York Volunteers. The General Commanding does not desire, at this time, to enter into any statement of the alleged grievances of this regiment, further than to say that he has examined into them and finds that they are frivolous and unfounded. This conduct is disgraceful in the extreme, both as soldiers and citizens, to all concerned in it. Those who have participated in this shameful affair have utterly disgraced themselves. They are unworthy of the sympathy of their fellow soldiers, and in acting such a part at a time when the services of every true man are required by the nation, they have rendered themselves liable to the suspicion that motives of the basest cowardice have controlled their conduct. This regiment has chosen to make the issue, and the commanding general is prepared to meet it. The regiment is ordered to return at once to its duty. All members of the regiment, whether officers or privates, who do not forthwith, on this order being read to them, return to duty, will be required to lay down their arms and will be placed in arrest, and refusing to do so, they will be fired upon. Of those who obey the order and return to their duty, the mutinous ringleaders will alone be punished. The regiment will be deprived of its colors, which will not be returned until its members have shown by their conduct in camp that they have learned the first duty of soldiers, obedience, and have proved on the field of battle that they are not wanting in courage. A copy of this order, with the names of the officers and men implicated, will be sent to the Governor of New York to be filed among the State Archives. Signed, George B. McClellan, Major General, Commanding. The execution of this order was entrusted to Colonel A. Porter, who took with him a battalion, a squadron, and a battery of regulars. They were drawn up in front of the mutineers, who promptly submitted. The ringleaders were placed in irons, and the rest marched over to the Virginia side. In the course of a couple of months, I was able to return their colors to this regiment as a reward for good conduct in camp and in several skirmishes. The regiment afterwards accompanied Sherman's expedition to Carolina and did good service. I think the trouble arose rather from poor officers than from the men. As an additional means of preserving discipline and the guard the camps from the presence of spies, the following order was issued. General Order Number 4, Headquarters, Division of the Potomac, Washington, August 16, 1861. All passes, safe conducts, and permits heretofore given to enter or go beyond the lines of the United States Army on the Virginia side of the Potomac are to be deemed revoked, and all such passes will emanate only from the War Department, the headquarters of the United States Army, or of this division, or from the Provost Marshal at Washington. Similar passes will be required to cross the river by bridge or boat into Virginia. A strict military surveillance will be exercised within the lines of the Army on the northern side of the Potomac, and upon all avenues of every kind by land and water leading to and from the city of Washington, as well over persons holding passes as all others. Passes will not be required at or within the lines of the Army North of the Potomac, but disloyal or suspected persons will be liable to arrest and detention until discharged by competent authority, and contraband articles will be seized. Officers and soldiers of the Army will obtain passes as heretofore ordered. All complaints of improper seizures or searches made, or purporting to be made, under military authority will be received by the proper brigade commanders, or provost marshals, who will at once investigate the same, and in each instance make report to these headquarters. By command of Major General McClellan, signed S. Williams, Assistant Adjutant General. In describing the steps taken toward the creation of the Army of the Potomac, it will be well to begin with the Memorandum of August 2, 1861, submitted to the President at his request. In my report, 
the date is erroneously given as of the 4th. This paper was necessarily prepared in great haste, as my time was fully occupied both day and night with the incessant labors incident to my assumption of the command and the dangerous condition of affairs. Memorandum. The object of the present war differs from those in which nations are usually engaged, mainly in this, that the purpose of ordinary war is to conquer a peace and make a treaty on advantageous terms. In this contest it has become necessary to crush a population sufficiently numerous, intelligent, and warlike to constitute a nation. We have not only to defeat their armed and organized forces in the field, but to display such an overwhelming strength as will convince all our antagonists, especially those of the governing aristocratic class, of the utter impossibility of resistance. Our late reverses make this course imperative. Had we been successful in the recent battle, Manassas, it is possible that we might have been spared the labor and expense of a great effort. Now we have no alternative. Their success will enable the political leaders of the rebels to convince the mass of their people that we are inferior to them in force and courage, and to command all their resources. The contest began with a class. Now it is with a people. Our military success can alone restore the former issue. By thoroughly defeating their armies, taking their strong places, and pursuing a rigidly protective policy as to private property and unarmed persons, and a lenient course as to private soldiers, we may well hope for a permanent restoration of a peaceful union. But in the first instance, the authority of the government must be supported by overwhelming physical force. Our foreign relations and financial credit also imperatively demand that the military action of the government should be prompt and irresistible. The rebels have chosen Virginia as their battlefield, and it seems proper for us to make the first great struggle there. But while thus directing our main efforts, it is necessary to diminish the resistance there offered us by movements on other points by both land and water. Without entering at present into details, I would advise that a strong movement be made on the Mississippi, and that the rebels be driven out of Missouri. As soon as it becomes perfectly clear that Kentucky is cordially united with us, I would advise a movement through that state into eastern Tennessee for the purpose of assisting the Union men of that region and of seizing the railroads leading from Memphis to the east. The possession of those roads by us in connection with the movement on the Mississippi would go far towards determining the evacuation of Virginia by the rebels. In the meantime, all the passes into western Virginia from the east should be securely guarded, but I would advise no movement from that quarter towards Richmond, unless the political condition of Kentucky renders it impossible or inexpedient for us to make the movement upon eastern Tennessee through that state. Every effort should, however, be made to organize, equip, and arm as many troops as possible in western Virginia, in order to render the Ohio and Indiana regiments available for other operations. At an early a day as practicable, it would be well to protect and reopen the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Baltimore and Fort Monroe should be occupied by garrisons sufficient to retain them in our possession. The importance of Harper's Ferry and the line of the Potomac in the direction of Leesburg will be very materially diminished so soon as our force in this vicinity becomes organized, strong, and efficient, because no capable general will cross the river north of this city when we have a strong army here ready to cut off his retreat. To revert to the west, it is probable that no very large additions to the troops now in Missouri will be necessary to secure that state. I presume that the force required for the movement down the Mississippi will be determined by its commander and the president. If Kentucky assumes the right position, not more than 20,000 will be needed, together with those that can be raised in that state and eastern Tennessee to secure the latter region and its railroads, as well as ultimately to occupy Nashville. The Western Virginia troops, with not more than five to 10,000 from Ohio and Indiana, should, under proper management, suffice for its protection. When we have reorganized our main army here, 10,000 men ought to be enough to protect the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the Potomac. 5,000 will garrison Baltimore, 3,000 Fort Monroe, and not more than 20,000 will be necessary at the utmost for the defense of Washington. For the main army of operations, I urge the following composition. 250 regiments of infantry, say 225,000 men. 
100 field batteries, 600 guns, 15,000 men, 28 regiments of cavalry, 25,500 men, 5 regiments engineer troops, 7,500 men, total 273,000 men. The force must be supplied with the necessary engineer and pontoon trains, and with transportation for everything save tents. Its general line of operations should be so directed that water transportation can be availed of from point to point by means of the ocean and the rivers emptying into it. An essential feature of the plan of operations will be the employment of a strong naval force to protect the movement of a fleet of transports, intended to convey a considerable body of troops from point to point of the enemy's seacoast, thus either creating diversions and rendering it necessary for them to detach largely from their main body in order to protect such of their cities as may be threatened, or else landing and forming establishments on their coast at any favorable places that opportunity might offer. This naval force should also cooperate with the main army in its efforts to seize the important seaboard towns of the rebels. It cannot be ignored that the construction of railroads has introduced a new and very important element into war, by the great facilities thus given for concentrating at particular positions large masses of troops from remote sections, and by creating new strategic points and lines of operations. It is intended to overcome this difficulty by the partial operations suggested, and such other as the particular case may require. We must endeavor to seize places on the railways in the rear of the enemy's points of concentration, and we must threaten their seaboard cities in order that each state may be forced, by the necessity of its own defense, to diminish its contingent to the Confederate Army. The proposed movement down the Mississippi will produce important results in this connection. That advance and the progress of the main army at the east will materially assist each other by diminishing the resistance to be encountered by each. The tendency of the Mississippi movement upon all questions connected with cotton is too well understood by the President and Cabinet to need any illustration from me. There is another independent movement that has often been suggested and which has always recommended itself to my judgment. I refer to a movement from Kansas and Nebraska through the Indian Territory upon Red River and Western Texas for the purpose of protecting and developing the latent Union and Free State sentiment well known to predominate in Western Texas, and which, like a similar sentiment in Western Virginia, will, if protected, ultimately organize that section into a Free State. How far it will be possible to support this movement by an advance through New Mexico from California is a matter which I have not sufficiently examined to be able to express a decided opinion. If at all practicable, it is eminently desirable, as bringing into play the resources and warlike qualities of the Pacific states, as well as identifying them with our cause and connecting the bond of union between them and the central government. If it is not departing too far from my province, I will venture to suggest the policy of an ultimate alliance and cordial understanding with Mexico, their sympathies and interests are with us, their antipathies exclusively against our enemies and their institutions. I think it would not be difficult to obtain from the Mexican government the right to use, at least during the present contest, the road from Guaymas to New Mexico. This concession would very materially reduce the obstacles of the column moving from the Pacific. A similar position to use their territory for the passage of troops between the Panuco and the Rio Grande would enable us to throw a column of troops by a good road from Tampico, or some of the small harbors north of it, up and across the Rio Grande, without risk and scarcely firing a shot. To what extent, if any, it would be desirable to take into service and employ Mexican soldiers is a question entirely political, on which I do not venture to offer an opinion. The force I have recommended is large. The expense is great. It is possible that a smaller force might accomplish the object in view, but I understand it to be the purpose of this great nation to re-establish the power of its government and restore peace to its citizens in the shortest possible time. The question to be cited is simply this. Shall we crush the rebellion at one blow, terminate the war in one campaign, or shall we leave it as a legacy for our descendants? When the extent of the possible line of operations is considered, the force asked for for the main army under my command cannot be regarded as unduly large. 
Every mile we advance carries us further from our base of operations and renders detachments necessary to cover our communications, while the enemy will be constantly concentrating as he falls back. I propose, with the force which I have requested, not only to drive the enemy out of Virginia and occupy Richmond, but to occupy Charleston, Savannah, Montgomery, Pensacola, Mobile, and New Orleans. In other words, to move into the heart of the enemy's country and crush the rebellion in its very heart. By seizing and repairing the railroads as we advance, the difficulties of transportation will be materially diminished. It is perhaps unnecessary to state that, in addition to the forces named in this memorandum, strong reserves should be formed, ready to supply any losses that may occur. In conclusion, I would submit that the exigencies of the Treasury may be lessened by making only partial payments to our troops when in the enemy's country, and by giving the obligations of the United States for such supplies as may there be obtained. George B. McClellan, Major General In the light of the experience of the 22 years which have elapsed since this memorandum was so hastily prepared, and after full consideration of all of the events of the long and bloody war which followed it, I still hold to the soundness of the views it expressed. Had the measures recommended been carried into effect, the war would have been closed in less than one-half the time, and with infinite saving of blood and treasure. So far as I know, it was the first general plan of operations proposed upon a scale adequate to the case. It recognized the importance of railways as a new element in strategy. It emphasized the vital importance of the railway system leading from Memphis to the east. It marked out the advantages to be derived from coast expeditions. It stated the part to be played upon the Mississippi. It foreshadowed the marches upon Atlanta and the sea coast. It called for a force which the future proved to be fully within our means, and which would have crushed the rebellion in one or two campaigns. In this connection, I would refer to the letters written by me to General Scott from Columbus in April and May 1861. The following was received September 7th and answered September 8th. General, it is evident that we are on the eve of a great battle, one that may decide the fate of the country. Its success must depend on you and the means that may be placed at your disposal. Impressed with this belief, and anxious to aid you with all the power of my department, I will be glad if you will inform me how I can do so. Very truly yours, Simon Cameron, 7th September 1861. Major General McClellan. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Washington, September 8, 1861. Honorable Simon Cameron, Secretary of War. Sir, your note of today is received. I concur in your views as to the exigency of the present occasion. I appreciate and cordially thank you for your offers of support, and will avail myself of them to the fullest extent demanded by the interests of the country. The force of all arms within the immediate vicinity of Washington is nearly 85,000 men. The effective portion of this force is more than sufficient to resist with certain success any attacks on our works upon the other side of the river. By calling in the commands of Generals Banks and Stone, it will probably be sufficient to defend the city of Washington from whatever direction it may be assailed. It is well understood that, although the ultimate design of the enemy is to possess himself of the city of Washington, his first efforts will be directed towards Baltimore, with the intention of cutting our line of communication and supplies, as well as to arouse an insurrection in Maryland. To accomplish this, he will no doubt show a certain portion of his force in front of our positions on the other side of the Potomac, in order to engage our attention there and induce us to leave a large portion of our force for the defense of those positions. He will probably also make demonstrations in the vicinity of Aquia Creek, Matthias Point, and the Aquaquan, in order still further to induce us to disseminate our forces. His main and real movement will doubtless be to cross the Potomac between Washington and Point of Rocks, probably not far from Seneca Mills, and most likely at more points than one. His hope will be so to engage our attention by the diversions already named, as to enable him to move with a large force direct and unopposed on Baltimore. I see no reason to doubt the possibility of his attempting this with a column of at least 100,000 effective troops. If he is only 130,000 under arms, he can make all the diversions I have mentioned with his raw and badly organized troops, leaving 100,000 effective men for his real movement. 
as I am now situated, I can by no possibility bring to bear against this column more than 70,000, and probably not over 60,000, effective troops. In regard to the composition of our active army, it must be borne in mind that the very important arms of cavalry and artillery had been almost entirely neglected until I assumed command of this army, and that consequently the troops of these arms, although greatly increased in numbers, are comparatively raw and inexperienced, most of the cavalry not being yet armed or equipped. In making the foregoing estimate of numbers, I have reduced the enemy's force below what is regarded by the War Department and other official circles as its real strength, and have taken the reverse course as to our own. Our situation, then, is simply this. If the commander-in-chief of the enemy follows the simplest dictates of the military art, we must meet him with greatly inferior forces. To render success possible, the divisions of our army must be more ably led and commanded than those of the enemy. The fate of the nation, and the success of the cause in which we are engaged, must be mainly decided by the issue of the next battle to be fought by the army now under my command. I therefore feel that the interests of the nation demand that the ablest soldiers in the service should be on duty with the Army of the Potomac, and that, contenting ourselves with remaining on the defensive for the present at all other points, that this army should at once be reinforced by all the effective troops that the East and West and North can furnish. In view of these facts, I respectfully urge that the available troops in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and at least 10,000 Illinois troops, there being 15,000 there unarmed, and all those of the eastern and northern states, be at once directed to report to me for duty. I beg leave to repeat the opinion I have heretofore expressed, that the Army of the Potomac should number not less than 300,000 men in order to ensure complete success in an early termination of the war. I also request that Brigadier Generals Don Carlos Buell and J.F. Reynolds, both appointed upon my recommendation and for the purpose of serving with me, be at once assigned to duty with this army. Also that no general officer appointed upon my recommendation shall be assigned away from this army without my consent, that I shall have full control of all officers and troops within this department, and that no one, whatever his rank may be, shall give any orders respecting my command without my being first consulted. Otherwise, it is evident that I cannot be responsible for the success of our arms. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, George B. McClellan, Major General, U.S.A. End of chapter 6